All right, well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thanks to Jenny and Lone Star Vet Academy as well as American Harm Society for um, inviting us to do this webinar today. So I'm really excited to uh, bring this topic to you all um, and particularly hear from um, both Angel and Katie on their, their uh, practices and how they address this topic in their different areas of work. And so um, just to give us a little bit of a, a start, I think everybody would agree that heart lung disease is a challenge. That's probably why you're here. Um, but just as a refresher, I've got on the left-hand side the um, latest heartworm incidence map from the American Heartworm Society. And hopefully you all know that um, heartworm is regionally endemic in all the 48 lower states, as well as Hawaii, as well as Puerto Rico. I believe Guam, Guam is also included in that as well. And we do see the incidence increasing every time we, we repeat this survey. So um, nobody is immune from, from this problem, regardless of where you practice um, and whether you're in private practice or in the world of shelter medicine or community animal care. And so what I've got on the right here is a list of some of the, the challenges that we have. And this is uh, specifically from the 2019 survey that we did of animal shelters, over 200 shelters across the country. But I put it here because I think that these, these challenges um, also apply to prior practitioners and to anybody who's, who's dealing with heartworm disease. And so, you know, the number one challenge cited by shelters in that study was cost. And I would imagine that's the same for those of you in private practice. And then we see two other groupings of, of issues as well. One is, is um, educating and managing the clients, the adopters, the foster homes. I think that kind of all falls into one similar bucket for me of another challenge that we're all facing. And then the last bucket is um, length of stay is really important when we're talking about time in shelters and managing these uh, dogs with uh, activity restriction during that recovery period. And so those things go hand in hand. And again, applies to both animals in private homes as well as in shelters. How can we keep them physically and behaviorally healthy during that period of recovery? Um, that's a real challenge for everybody. So I thought it was a nice comparison and way to get us started recognizing that there are, um, this is one challenge that we're facing together with very similar, um, similar components. So some of you may know that the Heartworm Society has a vision statement and, and it is a world without heartworm. And I don't think that we can get there unless private practitioners and those who are working in shelter medicine and community animal care can work together. And that's, that's the goal for today is to give you some ideas for how we can do that. And so Dr. Bice is gonna start us off and she'll answer the question of how can a private practice increase the volume of heartworm treatments performed while still practicing good medicine and being profitable. Dr. Broadus is going to look at how can shelters and private practitioners work together to carry out treatment protocols for newly adopted heartworm positive dogs. And then I'm gonna talk in the end a little bit about what is the best way to ensure heartworm positive dogs whose treatment is delayed do not further contribute to community or regional transmission. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bice. Hi, I sure wish my video was working, but it's not today. Hopefully you guys can hear me well. You can go ahead and go on to the next slide, Brian. So I, um, as Jenny mentioned, started off in shelter medicine, which I still love. And I ended up breaking off and starting a private practice um, because of all the animals showing up and owners showing up at our shelter asking for help and it's not something we could provide. One of those big ones was heartworm positive dogs um, in particular, including ones that came through for just our spay and neuter and we would let them know that they were positive, but they would have to go find treatment from there. Um, so that's one of the things that I really wanted to target with my private practice, and that's what I've worked towards. We all know that the biggest constraint are financial concerns. A lot of the times whenever we diagnose a dog as heartworm positive, the owners weren't expecting that result, didn't realize, didn't really even know about heartworms. So to bring on the discussion of the treatment cost is usually a really big, a lot of things at one time to discuss in one day, and it can be overwhelming for them. Um, so when it comes to the financial constraints, there's a lot of different ways that we can approach the situation um, in a good balance as we go through without having to make a decision from the beginning on how this is going to go. So first off, uh, one of the things is the delivery of the message. Never assume um, that adulticide treatment is not going to be pursued. Sometimes we get that block in our head 
um, that we know that the owner there was already financially constrained. And so we assume that they're not gonna be able to pursue treatment. And that's not always the case <clears throat> if we can break it down into smaller steps and work with them along the way. Um, so one of the big things I tried to avoid is the term slow kill in general. And I usually um, supplement that with the word supportive care. So we'll start with supportive care options. Of course, first we're gonna talk about everything, um, explaining heartworms, how they got heartworms, where we're at now, and our plan on where to go forward and what the best options would be. If we know that financial constraints are there, we're gonna start with supportive care. And that's gonna be our focus for that first day. Um, we're gonna talk about the extended delta side treatment options. We know in our head that those are gonna cause more pathology. And I'm gonna probably start them on one of those knowing that that might end up being our plan and we'll start it for now. But I'm not gonna come to the owner and say, um, we can do this or we can do that. So we're gonna start with our supportive care options first and along the way, we'll work through the plan. So I like to break down the treatment plan into different affordable steps. Of course, I give them a summary of everything up front, kind of give them a low and a high option um, of everything in between, but I like to show them that this is how it's gonna break down in a way that we can do this together. You can do go to the next slide. So heartwormtoolkit.com um, is a great resource to use to help you with your calculations, um, to give printouts for the owners of how are things gonna work and just to remind us of our timeline on how to do things. So day one, um, our first financial step, our dog is diagnosed. We're also gonna verify that. Um, we're gonna check for microfilaria. That's gonna be important throughout the process. So we wanna know that right away. If they're there, that can be our confirmation. If not, then we'll probably have to send out another confirmation test, a different type of antigen test. Um, if the owners can afford it, we're gonna apply a mosquito repellent um, and we're gonna begin and talk about the exercise restriction. Now this goes for if they're doing the full melarsamine injections um, or if they're just starting the supportive care, it's really important to have that discussion that the worms are in those lungs causing damage continuously. So start the exercise restriction as soon as we're aware that they're there. Um, if the dog is symptomatic, of course, we're going to add on some more therapies such as prednisone, and we're going to get them started on heartworm prevention. Um, obviously, one of the most important steps, if I have to get them to go home with just one heartworm prevention to get things started that day, I'll do that. Um, if I have a feeling based on the conversation that we're worried we're going to end up having to do um, a heartworm prevention that has known activity against adult heartworms, then I'll go ahead and choose one of those if we can afford to do so at the time. Based on our microfilaria status, of course, when you're doing the preventions, keep in mind um, the possibility of reactions and maybe doing some pretreatments for those. And that's when we're going to start our doxycycline. Very, very important step. Um, so if nothing else, we're at least going to start our heartworm prevention and we're going to go home with some doxycycline that four weeks is gonna be very important. You can go ahead to the next slide. And this is another step. So the diagnostic testing and staging, this is one that I think we get hung up on quite a bit that is ideal. And it's great to get more information about that individual patient. I do feel though a thorough physical exam is gonna let me know the best way for us to go forward. And any additional diagnostic testing is just gonna be for more information about that individual patient that we can get a baseline for. Um, but it's not going to change my treatment plan. And that's what's important. Whenever writing the heartworm guidelines, um, great consideration was taken into the wording to make sure practitioners knew it is ideal to move forward with injections if the owner can't afford additional workup. It's still ideal. So these are some of the words that you can find in the guidelines just to help remind you that it's ideal. We would love to have that information. It's extra information, um, but it's not going to change our plan to move forward. So just something to keep in mind. And if you find that your practice is being hung up based on doing injections and less additional diagnostics can be done, this is somewhere that you can reference. You can go to the next slide. So day one. Um, the owner comes in, they probably weren't expecting their dog to be heartworm positive. And so our bill is going to be a little more than they thought it was going to be. Um, and we're going to try to keep that as low as possible if they are in a situation of financial constraint. So I just try to throw out some numbers. I know things are going to be different on different areas. 
Um, but our, we have our office visit fee, we have our heartworm test, hopefully we checked for some microfilaria, um, and at least our lowest cost heartworm prevention for a 50 pound dog, we should be able to find something that's about 10 bucks just to get that first month going of something. Um, obviously we have a lot of choices to choose from and we'll choose that specific for that animal, but we'll send them with something to start with. Our doxycycline, we're gonna send home that whole month if we can. I have personally had owners that weren't um, prepared for it and I've split it up and they've come and pick up a week's worth of doxycycline at a time. So if we have to do that, we can do that. But it, ideally we're gonna send them home with that whole month of doxycycline to get that process started. And then there's our additional things as needed and as the owner is available to do so, such as radiographs and blood work and such. So for that very first visit, um, the owner is gonna be paying about $155. And then hopefully we have some overhead and profit from that day of at least about 120. We can go to the next slide. So we got through that first day and that's gonna be our longest period of discussing how this, how heartworm disease works, where we're at now and our next stages. Getting through that 30 days of doxycycline, personally, I feel like it's one of the harder parts of giving that twice a day for that 30 days. So once we've gotten there, I like to do a recheck. Um, sometimes I have one of my certified techs, that's my tech that works with me on side by heartworm um, injections. and they understand the process and I'll let them do this recheck just to see how, the, how if they finish their doxycycline now, like they were um, timeline prepared to do and to go ahead and have that discussion of the next step of starting malarcemine injections. This is also a good time now that it's been a month since that first financial visit to see if we can go ahead and fill a six month supply or a 12 month supply of heartworm prevention for them. It's a good time period to split the things up. So that time is when we're gonna discuss the cost and date. I've probably already thrown those numbers out at the first visit, but it was a lot of information at one time. So we're gonna go over that again, and I'm gonna split it up so that my injections, um, half of my cost will be due at the first injection and the remainder will be due at the second so that at the third injection, everything has been included. So with that first injection, um, we're gonna have finished our doxycycline. Keep in mind that it can be done past the 30 day period. So I have clients um, who say that they you know, have a tax check coming or they have um, some bills that they have to pay and it'd be six to eight weeks before they could save that money up. And that's okay. We can do that supportive care for a couple of months if we need to until they can save up enough money to get to that first injection. If they can only do that one injection, that's gonna reduce our burden by about 50%. So it's worth that being a goal if that's the only goal. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we give the timeline, it's great to follow, but there is a little bit of room and it's fine to go ahead and at least focus on killing that 50% burden, um, even if it's after that 30 day period. So if they don't feel that that's gonna be a goal they're gonna be able to reach, that's when we can start the conversations about continuing um, alter alternative heartworm preventions with adult side activity that hopefully maybe we even already started. And then we tried to schedule our treatments on the same day each month. We do them every two weeks. And this really helps us decrease the waste of that expensive malarsamine. So what we'll do is we do twice a month um, and we'll schedule about six dogs for each treatment date. And that keeps them grouped together and we can um, block our schedule off to focus on that for that day. Next. So at my clinic, Somerville Pet Clinic, the way that I charge is about $10 per pound. Um, it's rounded up um, with a $250 minimum. So a 50 pound dog, three injections would be about $500. That includes the steroids. I personally use Kenalog off-label use. Um, I just feel like it's easier on my techs and it's easier on the clients. And I know that they have a steroid on board. Um, I include the sedative because I like to use butorophenol or hydromorphone. Usually hydromorphone is my go-to. Um, and then some pain meds to go home as well. So the owner pays that half of the cost at that first injection, and then the remainder will be due at the next injection. You can go to the next one. So step two, this is that first injection. They come in, the steroids are so important. I see frequently that being traded out for NSAIDs um, because they're more worried about pain, but the steroids are super important. Um, that's going to be most important whenever those worms start dying in three to five days after the injection. So steroids definitely should be a priority at every injection. 
So pain meds, I like to give, like I said, they're not imperative. They do fine. I think that it, it makes it easier on our staff. It makes it easier on our patients. And we see less of the side effects of the anxiousness um, whenever we give those sedatives to begin with. So I include that in mind. Hospitalization for the day is ideal, but it's not something that I find absolutely necessary. If your hospital is going to have to charge extra money for them staying for the entire day, then I allow the owners to monitor at home. Um, I just try to give them a heads up about that so that they can have the day off of work. Just like if you were worried about a vaccine reaction and such, um, we give them a handout on what to look for. And we do our injections first thing in the morning so that we're here all day in case they have a complication, um, which is very, very rare for us. Most of the time we're seeing anxiety and restlessness. That's the most common thing. Um, so keep in mind, the most complications are going to come from when those worms are dying three to five days later. So pain meds to go home, some other options instead of NSAIDs. Um, some Tylenol-3, Tylenol-4, you can write prescriptions for those that so they can fill at human pharmacies, some gabapentin, methacarbamol, we have lots of options. So strict rest needs to be stressed. And like I said, I try to stress that from the very beginning. And then at that point, we're going to go ahead and plan our dates for the second and third injections. Um, again, if the owners need a little bit more time to save up more money, that's okay. We're still going to have that as our goal to get there. Next. So step three. Hopefully we did well for those first injections and we made it back for our second and third. So that second injection, we're gonna repeat everything that we did for our first injection. Um, we're gonna send those pain meds again home. It's okay to delay, like we just said, if they have to save up more than, it's gonna take more than that 30 days to save up to get to that injection. Um, and at that point, like I said before, the first injection, sometimes that's all I can get my owners to afford to get to and we were reduce the burden by 50% at that point. So if we have to, then we'll just continue with that alternative adulticide activity preventatives um, in those cases. Once we're done with our second, we'll be back for our third, everything's already covered. And then we'll follow the rest of our plan with recheck and microfilaria in one month and our antigen in nine months. Next. So just a quick summary. One of the ways that I start off with is just being careful about the way that I'm wording things. Um, the term slow kill, I really don't use it at all. And I think that one of the things that helps us as veterinarians is truly believing in that. Um, some of the things that have really hit home with me are Dr. Stephen Jones. He has an article in Today's Veterinary Practice that really shows the pathology. And that's a great one to review in just a short three month period. And that's why I really stress that we have that in the back of our minds as options, but we're really pushing to kill as many of those adult worms as soon as we can. So if you ever get a chance to take a look at that, it, it'll help you um, whenever you're convincing the clients, you, you truly are convinced as well and know the difference in those couple of months. Um, we can minimize the cost by splitting it up and spreading it out a little bit if we need to. And so for in the end, the total for the owner would be about $655. That's for everything from the beginning. And as my, my clinic should be able to make a, a profit of about $380 off of that. And the way that I'm able to make it efficient, like I discussed earlier, was scheduling them so that they're all in the same time period. Um, if you only see a couple of a month, and you're only doing a few, then do them on the same day. So I'm able to block off a time schedule of a couple of hours where my techs are getting everything together. It takes me about an hour of my time personally. And in that six dogs at that one time, I'm able to make over $2,000 profit for our clinic by putting all that together and making it efficient. Um, and hopefully making it easy for the owner and spreading it out and not coming at them with an estimate of around $1,000 um, where they don't feel like they're going to be able to reach that goal by splitting the goals up into multiple steps. It can really help the owner process and have small goals to reach throughout. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, we'll definitely be on here answering and feel free to reach out to me personally if you ever need to. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bice. So I want to give a little background um, on our shelter so you kind of understand how we built this partnership that I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, so I'm at the Austin Humane Society. We're a private nonprofit shelter, and we do not have a public clinic for owned pets. So historically, when we've had heartworm dogs coming through, we have a few options. Uh, of course, not treating and, and just disclosing to adopters is, of course, an option. Um, we find that we all know in shelters that 
chihuahuas could have no legs and still get adopted in about 10 minutes. So we find that our small dogs get adopted pretty quickly, even if they're heartworm positive. Whereas we see our larger dogs sit a little bit longer if they have a heartworm positive status. So certainly not treating is an option and we have great um, veterinary partners in the community that we can refer to and encourage people to seek treatment with. If we're treating in the shelter, which is another option, there's, there's obviously some challenges there that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and then of course, there's the option to start treatment or partner with a, a private practice. And I'm gonna to talk to you about why we sort of built that relationship um, here. So next slide, Brian. Okay, so um, you've heard some of this already. Brian mentioned some of these earlier, um, but challenges for the shelter, and I'm sure there are more than what I've got here, but challenges for heartworm dogs. Um, our big one that we see is heartworms is a huge adoption barrier for folks. They're immediately expecting quite a hefty vet bill and um, are a little bit afraid of the time and the process and the um, you know, isolation after treatment. And so we really find it to be a pretty large adoption barrier. And if you add that in with other adoption barriers like the age or the size of the dog, uh, we're all, I think, on the same page that larger dogs usually take longer to adopt, older dogs tend to take longer to adopt. So if you have a large dog and then they also have heartworms, we're dealing with multiple adoption barriers at that point. We find too at AHS that just an animal being on medications itself can be an adoption barrier, even if it's a medication that's pretty inexpensive. Um, so we keep that in mind as well. Um, and that sort of plays into when we start doxycycline for our shelter dogs. And we're usually gonna wait about a week after we diagnose them before we start doxy because some adopters come in and express that they don't want to take this dog home if they're on medications, but they're fine with adopting the dog and pursuing treatment after adoption. So that plays in as well. Um, and then we found one of our largest adoption barriers is just comorbidities in general. So the more co comorbidities we have, the more barriers there are to adoption. These may all be medical. For us, it's, it's all kinds of things. It's the demographics of the dog. So large dogs, um, certain breeds of dogs, age of the dog. And then you start adding in medical conditions and even behavioral issues and you have, you can have a list. So for us, sometimes heartworm is the easiest one to tackle. And our job is to try to get them out of the shelter as soon as possible, get them in a good um, stable condition so they can go home with their new family. So we're attacking those comorbidities sort of in a sequential order and prioritizing based on how critical they are, but also what will be the biggest barrier for the adopter. Okay, so other than adoption barriers, sort of some of our biggest challenges for treatment in the shelter are the post-treatment recovery period. And Brian alluded to length of stay. That's what this LOS means is length of stay. And that's a very important metric in shelters as we're trying to minimize length of stays because those both decrease the shelter's cost of care, but also decrease all of our secondary issues we see come up with animals. So stress-related illness, mental decline, um, and sometimes it's a barrier itself if the animal has a long length of stay. People start to think, well, why has he been there for 30 days? Something must be wrong with him. He looks really cute, but I'll, I'll hold off, you know. Um, so our goal is really to try to keep that length of stay as low as possible. And if we're treating in the shelter, sometimes that recovery post-treatment is going to be a barrier in itself. There are some, as you can imagine, if we're treating in the shelter, some risks of adopting in the immediate post-treatment period. So um, that's something we've discussed quite a bit at AHS is should we go ahead and start the treatment and then keep the dog available for adoption, realizing that you need really solid medical counseling at the time of adoption. We certainly don't want to start this process and um, send a dog home and not counsel adopters appropriately on the care that's needed. So um, this influences sort of how we make treatment decisions as well in terms of um, if we start the treatment at AHS, we're usually going to go ahead and do the whole process, either by putting the dog into foster care or into a foster to adopt situation until the treatment's completed. And then of course, cost plays in, like Brian mentioned earlier, um, both for diagnostics and treatment. We um, have some diagnostic capabilities in the shelter, but not all. So if we're needing x-rays or if we're needing echoes and things like that, that'll be an, an additional cost. Okay, next slide, Brian. So as we were developing this partnership um, with this private veterinary practice here in Austin, those were some of our considerations. You know, do we not treat, which in itself is a barrier, or do we treat in the shelter, which can 
um, prolonged length of stay and increase the shelter costs. And for some people become a, ba a barrier because they're dealing with this post-treatment um, confinement. Or can we partner in some other way that would allow dogs to go home sooner? Um, so we talked through sort of pros and cons of that. And then these are some of the pros of treating in the adoptive home versus the shelter. So assuming you have this veterinary partnership where dogs can go home and begin treatment in their new family, these are just some of the benefits. So obviously the bonding can begin immediately. This, this dog and family um, can get to know each other sooner instead of waiting while the dog they're interested in is going through treatment at the shelter and staying in foster care. Um, and some of the time they are the foster, so they can begin bonding in, in that way as well. Um, there's better access to follow up veterinary care. We are not um, a shelter that has a public facing clinic attached to our operations. And so we're not um, typically available to, to pursue follow up care if other questions are needed. And uh, we usually are partnering up these adopters with other vet clinics. So um, having that access to follow up veterinary care in the home is ideal. And then of course the owner is there 24 seven versus our staff um, overnight. For us, it's a it's a less a, less expensive adoption for the shelter, but also for the adopter. And I'll kind of go into that a little bit here in a minute. And then also the benefit to the dog and the family is part of this partnership is a requirement that the adopter buys six months of heartworm prevention from the veterinary clinic at that first consultation. And this promotes continued care beyond the heartworm treatment. For the shelter, there are Lots of benefits, um, but as I mentioned, it reduces some of our adoption barriers because people know that there is an option. Um, it's a reduced cost option for them, which we'll go into here in a second. It's a cost savings. So um, the shelter is saving money. We're still paying part of this treatment, but we're not paying for the full price um, versus treating in shelter. And then of course the cost savings have just reduced care days. And then we're building these relationships with private veterinary partners, which can span other, um, other cases. It's good to have these veterinary partners in general um, that know us, know how we operate. They know who to call when they have questions about adopted pets. And it's, it's just good overall for our, um, our adopters and the follow-up care in the community. Okay, next slide, Brian. So the benefits to the veterinary partner, um, and I'm speaking about one partner, but you could certainly set this up with multiple clinics. The main reason um, this clinic first decided to partner with us on this was just for the new client stream. They were looking for new clients and they felt like if we could um, not just send them referrals of adopted pets, but send pets that have immediate needs like heartworm dogs that need immediate care, it would be a new client base for them. Um, and we found that to be a good source for, for our vet clinics that work with us. And then the shelter subsidized treatment increases accessibility. So when they're talking to these adopters, they're not immediately saying, congratulations on your new dog. We now need to hit you with a thousand dollar estimate um, for care. They can work with us. The shelter is gonna pay part of this treatment. The client is responsible for part of the treatment. And then the clinic itself is donating part of the treatment. So all three of us together are working to get this dog treated and ensure that they're in a, a lifelong home that will have options for continued care with that same practice. The veterinary partners um, that we work with also see this as a way to give back, but in a very targeted way. So this is charitable giving for them. Um, for a 50 pound dog, for example, they're donating about $400 in supplies and services um, for each case. And so it's primarily donation of the overhead charge on, on the um, emeticide. So they're this is their way of giving back in a way that feels very meaningful to them. And then of course, as we build these partnerships with these vet clinics, this can lead to other referrals. So our staff knows we send heartworm dogs to Spicewood Springs Animal Hospital. They become trusted partners. Our doctors are referred more to Spicewood when there's, you know, if someone comes in and says, we need a new vet, who should we go to? We're going to reach to our veterinary clinic partners first because they're who we know the best. We, they, we can, vouch for them and give a good recommendation and feel good about that. Um, and then we do market our vet partners on our website. We try to market them in any materials that go home in the adoption packet, either printed materials or more recently this last year in um, electronic materials that we send home with adopters too. Okay, next slide, Brian. So this is the form that we use um, that we put in the adoption packet, again, either in a folder or going home over email with the adopters since we're doing curbside still. 
So our partnerships with Spicewood Springs Animal Hospital, their local clinic here in Austin. This partnership um, started very early in my time at AHS. So it's been about 12 to 15 years that it's been going on. Um, and we put this form in each heartworm positive dogs folder and it just explains the option to the adopter. So we're not trying to push that if you already have a vet, you need to stop and go to Spicewood Springs, but it gives people an option. And we say, um, if you are looking for options for treatment after you've adopted, you can certainly go to your vet. We encourage that. This is another option for you if you don't have a veterinarian at already. Um, and then we'll just write the animal's identification number. We use pet point. So it's out of our um, database and we'll include their medical records for Spicewood. And then um, they'll make an appointment with Spicewood following adoption. Next slide, Brian. So this kind of walks through the process. First, the dogs are tested usually at or near intake, usually within the first 24 to 48 hours that they're at the shelter. And once we have a heartworm positive diagnosis, we're using the IDEX snap tests. We'll note that in our shelter software, it both goes in the medical notes and we have these pop-up memos. So anyone who opens that dog's file will see heartworm positive right away um, for all the reasons that has effects on their, on their behavior, their um, enrichment at the shelter, their exercise, all the things. And then we'll write heartworm positive on the dog's adoption folder whenever we're doing in-person adoptions and using those folders. The adoption team will put that brochure that I just showed you, that form inside the folder or send it with the adopter materials after adoption. And then they counsel the adopter on heartworm treatment options like I was telling you. They can say, please follow up with your veterinarian. We don't provide the treatment here. Or if the dog has started treatment here, um, usually we're gonna go ahead and do the whole full treatment series. Um, so if that's the case, we'll walk them through that um, and, and what the post second and third injection care looks like. But if we're sending them home for treatment with the vet partner, we'll walk them through the options. You can go to your vet, you can go to this clinic who, who has this partnership with us, and this is what that looks like for you. And then we, we do have a few low cost options around town as well that we'll mention um, to folks. And so you can kind of approach this different ways if you're creating a partnership this way. For us, we include all heartworm positive dogs, but you could certainly choose to prioritize them based on the capacity of the clinic that's partnering with the shelter. Maybe it's um, the budget of the shelter and how much you're willing or able to contribute towards treatment. Um, there are certainly ways you can prioritize this if it doesn't work to, to put all heartworm positive dogs through this. So um, some ways you could prioritize. Again, we know that Small breed dogs tend to get adopted more quickly. So maybe this is a partnership that's more for the slow track, larger breed dogs that are gonna stay with you a little bit longer. You might look at other adoption barriers if they have concurrent conditions or um, behavior modifications needed. Maybe it's just for the more urgent cases. You can kind of pick and choose and decide what works best for you. Okay, next slide, Brian. Okay, so after we've diagnosed heartworm and we've um, labeled that appropriately on the dog's medical record, we've counseled the adopter. The next step after adoption is the adopter will schedule directly with the veterinary partner. So they call, they're given a certain time frame. I want to say it's within 14 days of adoption. They need to call and schedule a first consultation. At that first consultation, the clinic uh, waives the exam fee and they review the shelter records with the adopter. At that time, the doctor is asked to buy six months of heartworm prevention. Um, that's sort of the incentive to continue care. And then that's also a perk to the clinic that they're making some um, profit here, uh, but making sure that they see that adopter follow through. And then if any diagnostics are needed, and that's just based on that complimentary consultation exam, if they determine with the adopter that diagnostics are, are needed or the adopter just feels better about having blood work or x-rays prior to treatment, then the adopter will pay for the diagnostics. They will start doxycycline at the clinic if we didn't already start at the shelter and that's paid by the adopter. And again, our shelter is sort of trying to decide, it's sort of this trade-off game with length of stay. Um, we will usually start doxycycline within about a week after the dog comes in. Um, and then we'll send home some amount of doxycycline, usually a week or two if the dog gets adopted mid course, uh, but we're trying to sort of balance getting the dog into a home as soon as possible. So that first visit is just consultation, diagnostics if needed, starting doxy. Then they come about a month later back to the clinic, back to the private vet, vet clinic um, for malarsamine number one. And this is where the shelter pays the cost of the malarsamine injection. The injection's free to the adopter and the clinic charges us their cost 
they charge by the half vial, which is lovely and very nice. Um, so we're not paying the markup on melarsamine injection or for their labor involved. Um, so usually for a 50 pound dog, I would estimate the shelter ends up over the course of three injections paying maybe $350 um, for the melarsamine. And then the owner saves that cost plus the markup. They also, the clinic is waiving the exam fee. And then the adopter again pays for medications. So things like, um, and this varies by the individual veterinarian providing the treatment, whether they're using NSAIDs or steroids, and then they're usually providing tramadol um, for additional pain control. And then it, they'll come back a month after that first melarsamine injection for injections two and three, which they do 24 hours apart. And again, the adopter is paying just for medications at that point, and the shelter is covering the melarsamine. Okay, next slide, Brian. Okay, so this is just in summary, sort of how it breaks down. The shelter is paying for the cost of melarsamine. We're charging by the half vial. The clinic is donating their markup. They're also giving the free initial exam. So they're donating about $400 for a 50 pound dog. The shelter's paying about $350 for, for that same size dog. And then the adopter is just paying for diagnostics if needed, the non-melarsamine meds and their six months of heartworm prevention, which is a great reduction of cost for them. Okay, next slide, Brian. Thank y'all and I'll be around for questions. All right, thank you, Katie. So in this last section, I would like to talk a little bit about um, how we can stop the cycle of transmission if you are in a situation where a dog can't be treated right now or can't be treated where it is and is gonna be sent somewhere else for treatment. So this is a breakdown of some of the data from the survey that I mentioned at the beginning, um, over 200 uh, animal shelters across the United States were asked, you know, what percentage of dogs that you admit are heartworm positive on entry? And you can see a wide variety of responses, anywhere from zero for a few organizations, all the way up to 84% of the dogs coming in were positive. And so that just, it sort of astounds me every time I look at these numbers and just think about it, even if only two, three or four of every 10 dogs that came in were heartworm positive. I mean, that's just a huge challenge and a huge burden on many of these organizations. And there's there's no way that everybody's gonna be able to keep up with all of these. So we have to look for some other options besides treating them in place. And there are a variety of options available to shelters that are used, and this is just a sample of a few. I'm sure there's a number of others that are not up here, but maybe one option is the dog gets transferred to a local partner and it gets treated and adopted there. Um, maybe the dog is relocated to a, a organization that is further away in a different region of the country um, and treatment happens there. Maybe the dog is adopted directly um, and is in a program like uh, Katie just described or um, what Angel described as well and the treatment is, is up to them. Um, or maybe they're sent to foster care and that's a way that treatment is managed. Um, maybe this gets the dog out of the shelter, it doesn't necessarily save on the cost if the shelter is still um, bearing those costs, but it's one way of dealing with some of the issues and some of the challenges with treating heartworm positive dogs uh, in the shelter setting. And so, um, you know, I'm gonna focus on the relocation piece, but, but again, the, the idea is to stop um, that cycle of transmission until the dog can get treated. And so um, this really is applicable whenever that scenario presents itself. So here's a, a snapshot of the guidelines that I'm referring to that um, the, the American Heart Society and Association of Shelter Veterinarians put out um, a revised version earlier um, in, in the year. And um, the document is called Minimizing Heartworm Transmission in Relocated Dogs. And hopefully you all will, will check it out. It's a, about a page and a half long. Um, it's pretty easy to read, I think. Um, and what it covers is, is a variety of scenarios it, um, when you're dealing with the heartworm positive dog, again, focused on relocating them. How do you prepare them? What do you do? So um, it talks about testing. When do we need to test these dogs? Um, before they're moved? And then what do you do um, if they're positive and you are able to treat them? When can you move them? Um, positive, them, how do we make them move? And then um, I'll test negative. So those are the, the main headache covered in the document. And there's a for you if you haven't seen it yet, I'll take you directly to the, the PDF there and you can download it. And so um, again, it's real short. I encourage you to read it. And this is a revised version of a document that was put out a few years ago. And and I thought I would just touch on three of the key updates, um, key things that are different from that first edition. And so 
One of them is uh, the timing of testing prior to transport. So we added some language in there to clarify when that is done. Ideally, that's going to be done as close to the date of transport as possible to try to capture as many of those positive dogs can. Most of them are coming to the shelter with an unknown history, um, unknown preventive history, um, unknown harm disease status and exposure status. And so we want to minimize that window um, and try to try to capture all those infections, as many of those infections as we can. But there's obviously that natural um, prepatent period in there that, that causes some uh, problems with, with diagnosing them. So ideally, as close to day of transport as possible, but within 30 days um, will, be, is it, will be a good target for most organizations. We talk a little bit about the use of doxycycline in these, in these heartworm positive dogs and um, just clarifying that that should only be used um, when you've confirmed uh, infection with uh, heartworms. Um, and also some notes about timing re related to transport. So, you know, basically you don't want to give the dog a dose of its first dose of doxycycline on the day that's about to get on a, a vehicle and, and um, go on a multi-hour journey. So um, just thinking a little bit more strategically about when we start them on doxycycline. And then um, we expanded the section on pretreatment options. So you've got a heart and positive dog, it needs to go somewhere else now, how do we, how do, we do this pretreatment to make sure it's not posing a risk to any other dogs along or any other animals, I should say, along the way. One other thing that I wanted to point out that's in the revised version is, is a couple of statements here about the role of uh, animal relocation with these dogs. And so I'll just read it to you. It says, the AHS recognizes that large scale animal relocation for adoption plays a critical role in non-lethal population control of companion animals in the United States. And postponing or treating heartworm positive dogs may not be feasible for many source organizations of the organizations that are sending those animals to other places. And here's a really important part. In these circumstances, responsible relocation, like I'm about to describe, of heartworm positive dogs is encouraged to decrease reservoirs for community transmission and enhance individual animal welfare through appropriate management at the destination. I love that last section because it really gets to the point of, you know, if, you, if you're just sort of thinking about this on the surface, why would you send this dog somewhere else before treatment? Um, that really talks about why it's important. We're actually doing a lot of good for the individual dog and for vulnerable animal population as a whole. If we can prepare them appropriately and move them responsibly, it's better than leaving them in place and not treating them at all, in my opinion. So here's what the algorithm looks like. Um, so we've got this heartworm positive dog. Um, and by the way, we also specify if, if testing is not available, it may not be available at all, at all shelter organizations. Then we need to assume that that dog is positive and is, trans, um, is able to transmit that infection. So essentially that is microfilaria positive. And so we wanna make that assumption at the start. Now if we look over to the left, that's a little bit simpler. So I'll go that direction first. And so that's the case where we've got a microfilaria negative dog, but an antigen positive. Um, and so in that case, you know, like I mentioned, we're really targeting the microfilaria. We're really trying to disrupt that cycle of transmission. That's all about controlling microfilarial spread. So if the dog is microfilarial negative, let's get him started on the, the pretreatments with the, his macrocyclic lactone preventive, start them on doxycycline. But we really would like to retest uh, for microfilaria in about a week so we can confirm that they truly are microfilaria negative. If that's the case, great. Um, they're on their preventive. They've started doxycycline, send them on so they can get treated. If they are microfilaria positive, regardless of what the antigen test results um, says, we know that there is a risk for transmission there, so we want to address that. And there's a few different ways that you can do that depending on um, what is available to you and your organization. So one way is to use an approved uh, topical moxidectin product. Another option is to administer an approved macrocyclic lactone preventive along with a topical canine insecticide to address the mosquito portion of the life cycle, or administering an approved macrocyclic lactone preventive and an isoxazoline insecticide. And you want to do that if you're doing that option at least 24 hours prior to transport so that um, that will address any mosquitoes that come uh, and, and bite that dog. And then of course, all regardless of which option you choose, again, everybody should be started on doxycycline if you've, if you've confirmed a diagnosis. So I just wanted to break down a little bit further what each step in that uh, pretreatment protocol is meant to do. And, and the reason that we put them together this way is that we're, we're hitting the life cycle and we're disrupting the life cycle at two or, or three um, different parts so that we're really minimizing the chances of transmission as much as possible. 
And so the macrocyclic lactones are really important. If you've got a microfilaria negative dog, they're gonna prevent them from becoming positive. If they are positive, that should actually eliminate most of the circulating microfilaria so that they are no longer a transmission risk. Doxycycline, of course, if they're negative, that will also help prevent them from becoming microfilaria positive. If they are positive, it's gonna disrupt the development of those microfilaria so that if those uh, microfilaria are ingested by a mosquito, they're, no, uh, they're not gonna be able to uh, grow appropriately and infect another dog. And then we can even hit the cycle at a, at a third place if we address the insects themselves. So the topical canine insecticide, that'll prevent infection of mosquitoes, particularly if it's repelling them. Um, and then an isoxazoline will kill mosquitoes after feeding. And so just not to, just for completeness sake, um, you know, if you've got a positive dog, we want to think about what's going to happen at the other end. So this is just the start. This is that pre-treatment phase. We do need to complete treatment, um, ideally according to the AHS guidelines. And so, you know, sometimes we get questions about this dog that arrived from another location. It was started on the street. And what do we do now? There's, there's nothing different. It's, it's, you know, the same um, start to the treatment protocol as, as it would if the dog didn't go anywhere. So we're just completing the treatment, picking up right where they left off. And the other thing to think about is if they were negative because of that long prepaying period and the, and the chances of missing a diagnosis, um, you want to make sure that you repeat testing in six months from whenever that last negative test was. And of course, continuing their preventive product in the meantime. And that should um, help you address any or identify any infections that may pop up um, and keep those dogs negative. 